joint meeting and ask nominations to chair this particular meeting. Before we begin, um, she got the opening of the business, she has to make a number of copies of the comments. So, I'm asking you not to make any comments until I get you in the event that there's a fire alarm, so please make your way to the nearest fire exit. Don't we'll follow the instructions <coughs> of our police and fire alarm at last. Assembly punches across the car park, glossy room and impressive room and up to all chains. Um, it's quite uh, important that people follow that. No smoking obviously got a written in this uh fire in this one time moments. So it's located further along this cover on the opposite side, from the side of getting my item each door. If you acquire the use of these facilities, please respect the conduct of the business when you turn to the room without delay. Should you be requested to leave me for any reason but the an emergency, we would be glad to switch off any recording of the point to leave me in the role of belongings. Privacy and confidentiality request. Anyone present who has items related to peers of private confidential or exempt information to ensure that all that the items are, are not only displayed until such time as they may be required. Recordings and formal present proceedings of week may be recorded. Request if any operators have any objections to being recorded and offer the opportunity to leave the meeting. But please, more power forms and if you please, it's in the sound. I'm going to do it all. Then, Council Ayers, share this meeting with you, Dave, to meet them. Recordings have been out of this. Please request uh, any apologies, chief apologies from Councillor Tegnell and uh, Chief Director Dan Stevens. Is there any other apologies? Any declarations of interest? Is there any matters of urgency to admit onto the agenda? Exclusion of the best and proper due to the exposure of gent information. The rooms of last meeting were held on the 19th of March 2015 are submitted for approval as a correct report of the formation of the chair by the chair. Does any people accept the minutes to be correct? Item three. Yeah, I'll just introduce this uh, the report and obviously it got part part of the presentation by group manager Ben Ryder. Uh, ben will provide over the next 15 minutes or so an uh, update in relation to the Liverpool district performance. Okay, Ben, for hand over to yourself, you can uh, update members, please. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, very brief uh, introductions and welcome to the team. My name is Ben Ryder, I'm the district manager for Liverpool. 
um, and I have um, managerial responsibility for the fire stations in Liverpool, the two prevention and the two protection teams. And then I'll just introduce you to some of the members of uh, my team and supply some apologies for those who couldn't be here. So. Andy Horton, station manager for the Liverpool City Centre in Kensington, and I've got the responsibility for the protection of the Liverpool Fire Station Manager Paul McKay, I have responsibility for Topstead Community Fire Station and Valvera Community Fire Station, and I also hold the District Rapid School Community Prevention. Hi, I'm John Boyle, I'm station manager for Old Swan and Ancient Community Fire Station for the Liverpool District. I am Yoko, watch manager at Foxes Fire Station. I'm Mike Baratti, I'm the district prevention manager for the local site. Um, we also have apologies from um, station manager Marsden, he's actually at a Marek meeting uh, this afternoon. And we also have apologies from Sarah Wyatt. Sean, do you just want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Sean McGuinness, I'm the station manager for Fire uh, Station. Uh, Tony Brown, who's uh, the station manager for Croxford Fire Stations at a National Youth Hour meeting, and I'd just like to introduce you to one more guest, which is uh, Officer Greg Lambert from Merseyside Police. Uh, yeah, I'm Greg Lambert, Chief Inspector, Strategic Partnerships Coordinator for Liverpool Basic Command Unit. I've, uh, I've invited Greg in today <coughs> because of his role within all the partnerships within Liverpool. Um, because of, we've got quite a big management team in Liverpool, I only invite one partner in at a time. Um, the, the next partner for the next agenda would be Jenny Hughes, who's the safe and stronger lead. So, Sean, can you uh, Just a very brief introduction to the presentation. Um, it's to provide an overview of performance for Liverpool for 2014-15. Um, to provide a detailed description of partnership structures and the rationale for resourcing them, I think that's quite important to the authority to understand why we are putting such heavy managerial resources into some partnership areas. Um, and then what I wanted to do is to take what we are doing strategically and tactically and show you how we discharge it operationally. Um, and we're going to deliver a case study around vulnerable people and how we protect them. And that's going to be delivered by Mike Baratti, our the district prevention manager. Thanks, Sean. Um, just wanted to give you a, a, an overview, really at quite a high level of our performance. As you can see, our performance in relation to prevention protection for 2014-15 was very good. The one area of concern, which we'll touch on later, and uh, a change to our plans for 2015-16, which was around our <coughs> safety and RTC, but we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. Um, one of the big successes, albeit there's still a lot of challenges in relation to this indicator, is um, our accidental dwelling fires. As you can see in 2013-14 we had some real significant challenges and what we needed to do, given the uh, diminishing operational capacity and the uh, link to the appliance degradation list, was use our appliances and our frontline staff, including prevention protection teams, a little bit smarter. So we decided to amend our HFSC local strategy and use our assets more flexibly. <coughs> As you'll all know, we only have two key stations within Liverpool. So that means that we can use the fleet of fire engines <coughs> and staff to be able to do HFSCs across the district rather than just in their own station areas. So that was the concept we took, which was born out of the troubles in 2011. And I'll bring Paul Kay in now just to give you a bit more detail in relation to that. Paul, can you, John, can you open the link and get the map up, please? Thanks, Ben. The map uh, that you see on the left-hand side denotes areas that pose significant challenges in and around issues relating to community cohesion. And the map on the right, uh, all the red dots denotes accidental dwelling fires within the Liverpool district, and the blue dots signify the HFSCs that have been carried out. What we did was, instead of reinventing the wheel, we looked back to the success of the 2011 Community Reassurance Campaigns and utilised our resources both effectively and efficiently. Business intelligence provides monthly reports to all the stations and we send a minimum of three appliances every Tuesday and Thursday into Kensington fire station area and Old Swan. Old Swan having uh, 3,000 properties 
still to be visited, and so we, we focused our attentions on getting as many appliances into those properties as possible. On a Thursday, we also use that information to focus ASB activity and carry out HFSCs in that area. And what that's given us is, a, is good figures across the, across the board. <coughs> yeah. What's that? So, sorry, Ben. So, as a result of that, uh, we were able to conduct 12,786 uh, HFSCs in 2014-15, of which 8,352 <coughs> were carried out in city safe priority wards. Coming around the yeah. operational response performance, please. Yeah, I'd like to take the opportunity to outline um, the excellent staff we have with working within Liverpool districts. And obviously, sometimes, uh, despite our best efforts, we don't always um, we don't prevent every single accidental dwelling, dwelling fire. The ones that do occur, what we do is ensure that our response is appropriate and proportionate. And for the uh, the totals for the year 2014-15. Um, we achieved, we exceeded the 95% target for alerts and mobiles. And what we actually managed to do was confine each accidental dwelling, 93% of accidental dwelling fires were confined to the room of origin. Now what that means is our speed and weight of response is proportionate and it's effective. But what it also actually means is it underpins our HFSC message. So the crew's getting into the homes and giving the right advice because we're actually managing the ADFs that we don't catch, the ones that do exist, we're managing to confine to a room of origin on 93% of occasions, uh, which I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, implications uh, you know, for, for that. I think at this point, um, I, I'll be taking this back to the City Safe Board at some point in terms of just articulating to them how important we are as a partner in achieving resilient communities and improving community cohesion something that is going to be very, very difficult and challenging in, uh, in, in, the, in the coming years. Just in relation to this point as well, it, it is noted that Liverpool's um, population is going up by about 2%. We are also the northwest hub for asylum seekers. That's something that we absolutely welcome as a city. We want those people into our city. However, those people do come by virtue of the fact that they are asylum seekers with complex needs. Something that we all need to uh, react to as professional agencies and something that I know the Mayor Jo Anderson has gone on record of saying we all need to contribute to. So I just think this is really important to, to, to dwell on this point that we are absolutely building on asset-based community development and we are one of the lead agencies in relation to dealing with vulnerable um, I wanted to touch on some notable practice. Um, we've got the, obviously we've got the FireFit brand, and Paul's just going to outline the concept very, very briefly. Talk about the active challenge very briefly, and then I'll talk about it in a slightly higher level piece of work. Uh, so we continue uh, to deliver community engagement across the, across the district, and undertake diversionary activities using our FireFit uh, assets climbing wall, the smooth bike, cage soccer and the fire fit assault course. That's also leading to our main driver of fire fit schools and each year we culminate with a celebration activity which is the active challenge. We're in our fourth year this year where we see schools from across Merseyside take part in, uh, in a fun day of activity with firefighters and fire service staff and we all get together. Last year we had 500 children attend the, uh, the fire fit hub and it was a great day and this year's thing will be the World Athletic. Okay, I, I think this is this is a really important piece of work to know about. If you can just open the link for us, please. Um, the, the work that we've been doing with partners, and, and when I hand out the district plan, you'll see some <coughs> comments from partners. John Marsden have been attributed to one of the comments. We have actually been recognised by the International Olympic Committee as a, a as a best practice brand. There are only forty eight case studies globally, there are only two in the UK and we are one of them. And also, <coughs> this work stream doesn't end here. We have uh, two visitors, John, can you just give them yeah, a Yeah, I have Mr. Kava Marani, who's head of the Sports Development Department of the IOC. And we also have Mr. Bill Morris, hopefully coming uh, 14th of July. They are coming to the 14th of July to meet with myself and, uh, and Gary Oakford and obviously the Deputy Chief Fire Officer with his children and young people lead 
and um, his um, commitment to the Health and Wellbeing Board has been instrumental in making this happen. But this is a big achievement for not just the authority, but for the city. So we will update you on that in due course. Uh, another area that we think is a notable practice and I know has been achieved right across Merseyside is the uh, Safe Havens. John, can you just talk yeah. about the Obviously the Safe Haven initiative basically come from the unfortunate death on time of death of Jimmy Wisden in 2008 in London. Basically he was looking for somewhere to go as a, as a refuge to get away from He was being pursued by gangs and stuff like that. In December 2014 all of Liverpool District's community fire stations became Safe Havens. Uh, we had the signage out and we had a, a set procedure out as well. We've always been perceived as being places of, of relative safety. Now we have a set procedure and it's for the most vulnerable people, young children, adults, whether they feel vulnerable, harassed, threatened, bullied. Our, our premises are there 24 7, 365 days a year and it's right across all of Liverpool. I, th I think that's a, again a, a significant contribution to our communities and for me, it's something that I'm very, very proud of as a third generation firefighter to showcase how welcoming our fire stations are. I think it's really important. Next bit of best practice. Um, there will be a fun element to this and, and someone in the room will be broaching. Um, but but, but we, have, we have to get this in and I'll take my punishment to it later. Uh, Paul, can you just um, explain the concept and where it came from? Okay, uh, it just shows that junior officers as well are uh, getting fully involved. Uh, watch manager Paul Moss, back there, was sat at home with his grandson and when the trailer for Planes 2 Fire and Rescue came on, he, he thought it was a good way that the fire service could interact with this, uh, with this new film, Disney film. As such, we made contact with Liverpool Odeon uh, Cinemas at Liverpool One and Liverpool One themselves about coming together, highlighting road safety uh, and home fire safety checks across, <coughs> across the district during the summer holidays. We were able to put on a full road safety demonstration right in the middle outside uh, John Lewis. Planes Firing 2 was also being shown to the kids and then when they were going in to watch the film, right across the summer holidays, we had a trailer before every film uh, got into the galaxy and Planes 2, highlighting best practice for uh, home fire safety checks. This is probably the bit where me and Paul have an, uh, a wonderful career behind us. So, can you show the link please? Oi! You? Yeah, you're at the back. Are you listening? Because what I'm about to say may save your life. This is a smoke alarm. You need to have one of these on every floor in your home. And this noise may save your life. Oh, and by the way, if you want to meet the real life heroes, please have Fire and Rescue Service are hosting a fire safety awareness day on the 8th of August in Liverpool 1. Be there or be square. Right. And a big thank you to Liverpool Odeon, Disney, Wayne's 2, Fire and Rescue for this opportunity to speak to you personally. Enjoy the film. I just think obviously a little bit of fun there in terms of uh, embarrassing the deck, but I just think if you think how many families saw that in commercial and, and how widespread that would get our message across. I think there's very, very few agencies, either public or private sector, that would be, would, that would be able to that, have that done. In terms of innovative thinking, our crews are right at the forefront, our, our staff are right at the forefront of coming up with this innovation. And, and as middle and strategic managers, we make sure that their vision happens. I think that's just quite important. So can we uh, just move on to the next bit? Um, what we wanted to do is obviously build on what we've done well in 2014-15, address what we hadn't done as well or where our successes hadn't been and, um, and also look to engage with partners so that partners could contribute to our priorities as much as us contributing to theirs. So, um, Appendix A, um, which was within the report,
just sort of the, <coughs> the partnership structure within Liverpool. This looks very, very neat. If you look to your right, you'll see the health and wellbeing board, safeguarding board. Every other strategic board has the same number of thematic strategic partnerships and then tactical and operational partnerships beneath it. So it actually doesn't really look like this. It looks more like a spider's web. And uh, Greg would absolutely buy into that because he sits on most of these partnerships with me. The good thing about sitting on the partnerships is it enables us to look holistically and utilise other agencies' resources to be able to contribute to our message. Safer, stronger communities, safe, effective firefighters. Um, as you can see, I mentioned the changes in the ISB statute uh, within the report, and then um, it's now um, sort of coincidence that um, I am the multi-agency ISB strategic chair for that partnership. Um, basically, the changes in the statute were to focus more around vulnerable people <coughs> and the victims of ISB, and I'm working extensively with the, at the moment with Greg and uh, Jenny Hughes to set up a vulnerable victims jag and that will basically <coughs> be sort of mirror the hate crime jag that currently sits. It's quite an extensive piece of work. What's the benefit for us in terms of putting so much managerial resource into that partnership? Well, we've vastly reduced our ASB secondary fires, which allows us to do more prevention work, more protection work, more training, gather more um, site-specific <coughs> risk information. Paul, can you just give us the figures and then be reduced by? We attended uh, 1,727 antisocial behaviour fires 2014-15, which was 575 fewer than the previous year. That's a significant reduction. And, um, the, it, it, this year is continuing with that trend given we usually have a spike in April and, and we didn't this year. So, so that's, that, that's a pretty good piece of work. <coughs> Obviously, like I said today, we, at the operational level as well, we also have officers embedded. So Gary Marsden's at the Marach. Marach basically deals with victims of um, domestic violence. So we are contributing in every way, shape and form to the, most, to the protection of the most vulnerable people within our communities. The Deputy Chief Officer sits on the Health and Wellbeing Board. With the links between fire and health, are, they're intrinsic. And I think that's an area that we should absolutely look to work with our partners and enhance some of the uh, deprivation and some of the health inequalities in our city and the Olympic. Um, the, the, the Olympic case study sort of articulates that and captures it quite well. You can just come out of that, Sean. I'll skip the next two points because this is where Greg and, and, and Paul will come back to in a moment. But in 2015-16, I also articulated in the report around the CARE Act being implemented. This is a key piece of legislation and basically what will happen is our, the most vulnerable people will no longer be cared for within a respite environment. So not hospitals, not residential care settings, they will be fit cared for in the community. That could have a significant impact on us, especially when you give the trend of fire deaths and injuries, and for the over 60s in particular. So, as a management team in Liverpool, we have worked very, very hard to enhance our prevention activities and our safeguarding procedures. One of the first being the commitment to the pre EHAT with a number of other agencies, including police. And EHAT stands for Early Health Assessment Tour. There's going to be three hubs within the city, one north, one central, one south, and basically we will work with partners to safeguard children and families. Why did we put so much resource into making that happen? Well, we knew that the Liverpool MASH, multi-agency um, safeguarding hub, was being established within the city, and we knew that phase two would move into vulnerable adults and we are looking to, to significantly um, to significantly contribute to that but also <coughs> to significantly affect its design and implementation. 
but if we hadn't have contributed and, and, and put in such resource in the first instance down river, I don't think we would have had much sway amongst the partners to be able to make that happen. So uh, that should hopefully enhance us in the forthcoming year. I'll just introduce Greg now to talk a little bit around uh, an addition to our partnership <coughs> work in, in 2015-16 and how it came about. Um, Merseyside Police are very much in the same boat as the Fire Brigade. Um, quite simply, having to do more with less. Um, and one of the key things for us is trying to establish what we do, where others do it, and where that convergence lies. Because that way we get efficiency and effectiveness. I think it's very much fair to say that Ben and his team um, pretty much started hammering on our door probably six, eight months ago, preaching that message to us, looking for those areas where we could find that convergence. Um, and we've managed to sit down, discuss it in quite a level of detail and found, quite obviously I suppose, that there are many areas that we've both got joint responsibilities in, key ones being antisocial behaviour, arson reduction and road accidents and deaths. So as a consequence, we now have a monthly management meeting where Ben and his wider team and the command team for Liverpool North and Liverpool South, which is now joined to as Liverpool BCU, sit down and we go through our key areas of concern and we look for those areas where the fire brigade can assist us or vice versa. And I have to say, um, it's been absolutely fantastic. We've always had a very good relationship with the fire brigade. Um, but what it's brought home to me and to the rest of our colleagues is just how uh, beneficial it is for us as a police service to actually look outside our own parameters because some of the stuff that these guys and Ben have brought to us have massively enhanced what we do and to be fair at very little cost to us. And to give you an example, one of our major problems is organised crime. Um, what we noted um, was you were much more likely to be targeted by organised crime groups to have your house petrol bombed or subject to an arson attack as opposed to being shot or stabbed or physical attacks. And that's where the information from Ben and his team has been absolutely key. By working closely with them, we've looked more into the detail behind threat reduction and the fire safety visits, and that's made a massive, massive impact. So we are, certainly we've had our eyes open to the benefits of this wider partnership working, if you like. It's something that happens in Liverpool. Uh, when I go to the strategic ASB group on the police side, it's certainly something that I'd be advocating to them, and I'd be inviting Ben along to extol the virtues of it, because from our point of view, it's been massively, massively impacted. So big thanks to Ben and his team uh, for the input that they've had with us, because it's been really beneficial. Thanks, ben. thanks very much, Greg. Um, <coughs> also, what, what that relationship does, and the enhancements in that relationship through the monthly meetings that we have, that whole also transgresses onto the incident ground. You'll all be aware of the new Jessa principles, Trains Emergency Services Interoperability Programme. As a service, we've been right at the forefront to help the national <coughs> exercise. And I think meeting with each other in such an informal setting and working on prevention activities, when it does come to the sharp end and actually given, uh, have an operational response, those relationships pay real dividends on the incident ground. Um, just to give a, a, a very brief example of um, something that's already come out of those command meetings and the community press of investment meetings, so I'll just introduce Paul. So one of the issues that we've got are road traffic collisions and, uh, and KSIs mm -hmm. killed seriously injured from the police and the local, uh, local city council. So what we did was we realised trying to get into schools from three separate parties is, is really difficult. Uh, we spoke with Chief Inspector Chris Hitch who sits on the command team who leads for road safety and Jane Black from Liverpool City Council. What we've done is we've come together, uh, Liverpool City Council lead on um, pedestrian safety for primary schools, we lead on suddenly from nowhere and the police have their package which is an overview for both primary and secondary schools. You know, today's young people are tomorrow's drivers and what we're able to do is as a joint unit coming together and put that message across in structured appointments throughout the calendar year. It's just important to note that those resources are also targeted and it's set on the prevalence around road safety for schools. So we are absolutely again utilising resources smartly rather than just having a static on approach. Um, what I'd like to do now, if you just indulge us, I'll probably <coughs> run over and I do apologise, but 
you've heard a lot of um, probably, probably managerial talk around what we do. I'd just like to bring it right down to the grassroots level and uh, allow Mike to, to give a brief presentation around what we do in terms of working with vulnerable people. And this is a real case study. And it went to the Safeguard and Adults Board just to articulate what we do and help them engage with us with that MASH concept of protecting vulnerable people. Right, thank you. Thank you. Group manager Ryan said this is a this is a very recent case study as well. And it's a really good example of partnership working in the, in the safeguard and adults arena. And so just a couple of objectives. We're going to provide an example of how risk and hazard can be interpreted differently by the various different agencies, and also how knowledge and understanding influences our appetite for risk. I'm just going to talk very briefly about the referral itself. Uh, we received this referral from a support worker. Uh, from a support agency, and it was uh, she had real concerns over over fire risk uh, for this particular female. Uh, and this occupier was a known drug user, uh, smoker, and she lived a really chaotic lifestyle. And I just want to stress that point at the bottom that this referral, that support worker referring this into us, has dramatically reduced the risk to the occupier herself, at the local community, and also frontline responders, including including um, category one responders. So the visit itself uh, came to the local South Prevention team and we attended the address uh, three days after the referral came in. Uh, it was attended by one of the advocates in the local <coughs> South Prevention team. Okay, and there was a number of fire safety concerns observed during that visit. First of all, the, the quantity of, of butane that was potentially being inhaled by the tenants. I'm just going to show you a very quick video <coughs> from Jeremy Carl, probably the first couple of minutes, just to put into context the, the issue that's out there, which is a, a growing problem for us. 